HEC Breakthroughs. A knowledge at HEC Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome to HEC Breakthroughs, your monthly podcast by the Knowledge at HEC team. We show how these scientific explorations relate to and impact on the challenges our world is facing. I'm Daniel Brown, the school's chief editor. Today we talk to Associate Professor Matteo Winkler about a paper he co-authored on one of South Africa's modern icons. No, I'm not talking about Nelson Mandela or Miriam Makeba, but the 800-meter Olympic champion Castor Semenya. On the eve of the Tokyo Games, Matteo reflects on an athlete who will not be able to defend her crown. Instead, Semenya will be preparing her case for the European Court of Human Rights. She's hoping the court will reinstate her right to compete over her favorite distance. I think that in this case, what is at stake... Matteo Winkler. ...is not just a person's uh, eligibility to, to run in a competition, but what is at stake is the way we perceive our bodies uh, in the face of the law. This is not an easy case. But this is not even a joke, because, you know, when we talk about intersex, uh, homosexuality, gender, sexuality in general, there is a tendency to laugh and to take things superficially and to, to ignore aspects which pertain to the intimacy and to the emotional part and to the way we feel. But here she goes, Semenya is on her way once again in that rolling buccaneering style. Brilliant. Are we on for a world record here? 153.28. It's just outside. What a time. 154.26. Another meeting record. She made it look effortless. Once again, Casta Semenya. No pacemaker required. It's all about Casta. And just to requote her, I just want to run naturally, she said. I am a woman and I just happen to run quickly. And once again, she's I think this exactly is that. pretty straightforward. It's and it's very straightforward for any international federation in sport. Sebastian Co. Athletics has two classifications. It has age, uh, it has gender. We are fiercely protective about both, and I'm really grateful uh, that the Court of Arbitration has upheld that principle. That was law professor Matteo Winkler, followed by comments on some of the highs and lows of Castor Semenya's athletic career. First, the runner outpacing the world's best women at 800 metres for a 37th consecutive time. Then we heard World Athletics President Sebastian Coe praising a controversial ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sport, or CAS. This 2019 decision regulates women athletes who are born with naturally high levels of testosterone. As a result, they have what's called hyperandrogeny, and, the CSO ruling says, they must cap their testosterone levels. However, it only applies to races between 400 metres and the mile. To reduce these levels, women must accept measures that range from taking drugs to physical operations. Both can have lifelong effects on their health. And she said she doesn't Dr. Frank Montgomery of the World Medical Association. It's entirely unethical to administer drugs to someone who doesn't need them. This controversy has been percolating for over a decade now. Two years ago, HEC law professor Matteo Winkler and Giovanna Gileri began their exhaustive study on this affair. Dr. Gileri is an expert in gender binarism. That's the classification of gender into two opposite forms of masculine and feminine. In April, the two researchers published an exhaustive deconstruction of four narratives at the heart of Semenya's case against the CAS. It came out in the prestigious Journal of Law, Medicine and Ethics. In their 40-page paper, Winkler and Gileri lay bare the way the Semenya case crystallizes our sometimes uncomfortable relationship with gender sexuality and femininity in the Global South. To find out more, I contacted Professor Winkler in his legal offices in Milan. HEC Breakthroughs, a knowledge at HEC podcast. Hello, Matteo. Good to have you on HEC Breakthroughs live from Milano. Thank you, Daniel, for this call. You've entitled the paper of Athletes, Bodies and Rules, subtitled Making Sense of Castor Semenia. It's early days. The article only just came out, but... 
clearly you're tapping into a subject that has touched a lot of people. In South Africa, for example, she's an icon and the government is strongly backing her case in the European Human Rights Courts just now. What has been the response to your research paper so far? It has been very positive. And in fact, there has been a certain debate uh, among colleagues about uh, this article and the extent to which it can be used uh, to progress on the uh, Castor Semenya case, which is currently pending European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So we will see what the outcome will be. Yeah, we will indeed. And we'll come back to that court case later on. This research, Matteo, has been a labor of love for you in some ways. You've been studying Semenia and her, her case for two years now. What first brought your attention to her ordeal? So the first time I dealt with um, this case was when I was invited for a call for papers uh, at the uh, European University Institute in November 2019. And uh, I had to study the award and I found absolutely amazing that the case uh, touched upon many of the subjects that, are, that I've been studying uh, in the last few years, such as gender, gender binarism, and sexual orientation and, and gender identity, which are part of my research. So I can tell you that Castor Semenya synthesizes um, in a very significant way the, all the subjects that have been studied pertaining to you know, uh, the application of law to the bodies, uh, the relationship between body and rules, how how uh, we conceive our bodies as machines, which is very uh, very good as a metaphor in sport, and also uh, how uh, regulations can change, in fact, the perception of gender and gender identity and sexual orientation in people, and in this case, in particular, uh, in sport. But for me, uh, I think I've studied that. <laughs> Castor Semenia at the 2019 Prefontaine Classic after she won the 800 meters with a record time of 1 minute 55.7 seconds. Um, I know how to handle situations. Uh, I know how to manage my time. Uh, I know how to focus on what I'm doing. Uh, I think uh, other people's perceptions um, of me is their own problem, not my problem. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're all human. Uh, we make mistakes, um, but um, it's about you know how we handle you know ourselves. ATC breakfoods. At the same time, her case has become a cause célèbre, not not just in her native South Africa, but worldwide. Human Rights Watch uh, recently published an 84-page denunciation of the abuses leveled at the athletes uh, back in December of last year, that was. How does your article complement and enrich the debate? So my article is, uh, our article uh, is very original in the sense that we look at the case from a very particular angle, which is the angle of the narratives. The case is very hard. Just to, to explain, Semenya is a woman and she was eligible to run with uh, women in the uh, women category with the IAAF, which now is, is called World Athletics. Uh, and uh, she won in 2009 in Berlin and her body was subject immediately, was immediately subjected to a hyper uh, scrutinization and uh, this uh, monitoring action took place because the way of the way she looks she 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 is muscled uh, she's tall uh, and uh, she uh, doesn't have much breast and her body has a shape of that of a man uh, while she's a woman this is maybe you know the most striking uh, moment where you can see how our bodies are in fact subject to scrutiny and social control. But she had, uh, you know, the particularity that she um, was not within the categories of transgenders or of intersex, which uh, had been uh, considered, legislatively speaking, by the by the sport authorities. One thing that um, was relevant is the debate that her victory generated in the fact that 
the IAAF uh, wanted to regulate cases like hers. So to say, if you have uh, too much force in your muscles, in your body, you shouldn't compete with women which are considered by their body shape and body nature, they are not considered as strong as men. Women's bodies. Maite Nkwana Mashabane, South African Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. Their well-being, their ability to earn a livelihood, their very identity, their privacy, their sense of safety and belonging in the world are being questioned. So we, we argue that this case creates four narratives which will drive the lives of many people after Semenya and of Semenya herself, and that express social practices for um, narratives, in particular the fact that uh, deciding on an athlete's eligibility is not deciding about uh, her sex and gender. This is something that the Tribunal for Sport says very clearly, like we're not deciding uh, on uh, whether uh, you know Semenya is a man or a woman, we're deciding simply on her eligibility in terms of testosterone Level, but the problem is that at the end of the day, the the, the tribunal says, uh, yes, Semenya is a woman, which is like you know, kind of contradictory in respect of the premise of this reason. The second narrative concerns testosterone. The question here is whether testosterone is or not an accurate predictor of athletic performance, and the the, the tribunal says yes. All the scientific evidence brought in by the tribunal say yes, but in fact, there are very few studies that connect the level of testosterone uh, to athletic performance. We argue that these studies have been uh, tainted by scientific bias and by uh, inaccurate methodologies. And this uh, inaccuracy and biasing have been highlighted by other uh, researchers. Uh, which we summarize in our article. The third narrative is that the required testosterone suppressive treatment is safe and harmless. Uh, this is not the case because, in fact, the testosterone suppressing treatment is not safe and is very harmful for the body of athlete. In fact, you compete, you are obliged to compete with the body that does not respond any longer to your own actions. It's a body that is pain is in pain because of this treatment and of course is a body that cannot be efficient uh, to do the sport as it should. And finally, we tackled maybe the most difficult of these narratives, which is a narrative under which the case, the Semenya case will now protect women as a whole. This, the, here the argument is that, which has been advanced by some scholars, is that basically if you exclude Semenya from eligibility, you basically allow other women which are weaker than her to compete, and this will enlarge the, the population that could compete. Now, the problem with this argument is that which, at which cost do we allow the majority of women to run by excluding a minority of women based on their biological characteristics. So this is the real problem. Hey guys, I'm Chad Leclerc from Swimming Team SA, and I support Custer through this difficult time. I've known her since 2008. Where we both carried the flag at Pune for the Youth Commonwealth Games. She's a great ambassador for the country, and I say hands off Custer. Many, including yourself, have made parallels with the uh, scandal around Sartje Bartman, uh, who was derogatorily called uh, Venus Hottentot. And uh, you say that she is the latest example of anti-black, anti-South, anti-gay, colonialist-like prejudice. Could you elaborate? Yeah, so Sartje Bartman was uh, born in uh, 1789 in uh, South Africa and was brought to Europe, and she was exhibited half-naked for years, and uh, her body systematically examined by anatomists, zoologists, and physiologists. 
and she lived until 1815 when uh, her genitalia and brain were excised and preserved in formaldehyde in Paris. And I think res- recently, uh, in 2002, her remains were returned to South Africa. And so if we consider uh, the different geopolitical and historical context between Semenya's case and Bartman's case, what remains is the fact that the aspects of bodies have been uh, very much of interest, especially in the Western countries, as something, you know, exceptional and, and, and worth of scientific interest, as if these bodies were something that comes from another planet, not from Earth. And in fact, the problem of hyper- uh, scrutinization is very well known in sociology, especially when we talk about the relationship between body and space. And we find this anytime, you know, in Black Lives Matter, for example, you have this problem of policemen targeting uh, African Americans because these African Americans are perceived to be out of their place in certain contexts. So, so this relationship between uh, body and, and space, we find it very much in both cases of Bartman and Semenya. So the idea is that we dehumanize the black body and we portray it. I mean, when I say we, Certainly, you know, the, the society, like Western societies, we portrayed it as dangerous, as uh, fearful, uh, and at the same time, full of fascination as something that creates a surprise, right? So, so the, the, way she, the way Bartman was treated, cut in, literally cut into pieces and her pieces preserved to be seen by the public, uh, is very much similar to what Castor Semenya, who happens to be from South Africa, who happens to be Black, is suffering right now. And in fact, you know, one of the problems of the uh, World Athletics regulation is that basically, how do you know if someone has testosterone level that is above the threshold? Well, the answer is because you see it by looking at these athletes' bodies. You see it because their bodies do not correspond to the typical weak female body which exists in the, in the Western culture. So, so the appearance of uh, the body is extremely important, even if we usually try to say that we don't judge people for their aspect. Of course we do. And uh, the parallel that uh, Giovanna and I make in this paper uh, shows it very well. Yeah, <laughs> of course, when I run, uh, I forget about everything. Uh, it's just all about me. It's, it's all about me being free. Uh, it's all about me doing what I love. So, yeah, you know, I, I always want to win when I step on the track. Since I was a little girl, so I've always wanted to win. You know, it doesn't matter what I do. Play soccer, play baseball, you know, you know played, you know, boxing and stuff like that. I always want to win, so I'm a, I'm a very positive, you know, person. And I always want uh, what's good for other people. So, yeah, I treat people with respect. Uh, and, uh, of course, I appreciate them for who they are. So I accept them. So that's what I do. Uh, like I said, for me, it's, it's all about, you know, inspiring, you know, the, the youth. Uh, so they can be better. Matteo, this isn't just about world athletics. The swimming champion Michael Phelps, uh, the legendary sportsman Usain Bolt and uh, Lionel Messi in football. These legends have all certain natural immutable genetic traits which have played in their favor in their respective disciplines. Why are they ignored and only women like 800-meter champions Castor Semenia, Burundi's Francine Nyon Saba and the Kenyan Margaret Wambui been targeted? This is explained by the gender binarism that exists in sport. So basically the hyper-scrutinization to which these bodies are subject to it happens only for female bodies and not to to male bodies if a man has an, a competitive advantage this advantage is all is always associated 
to his strength and is not pathologized uh, medically. While if uh, to have an extraordinary strength, it's a woman, she is naturally subject to a more intense monitoring in the sense that we look at her testosterone. While, you know, for example, Michael Phelps, he, we don't ask Michael Phelps to uh, cut his fingers or his feet because he's too fast in swimming and is too long and he can, you know, use his hands and feet as a force, an extraordinary force. Uh, and uh, while we do uh, ask Semenya to get some pills to diminish her force. Or even so, an operation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was, a, that was one of the, the topics that we touched upon in the article, which is the idea that you intervention on the body. Of course, the IAAF will not tell us that they ask the athletes to uh, act upon their bodies physically, I mean, chirurgic chirurgically, but, but uh, at the end they do. So there were cases where some athletes have been subject to gonadotectomy because they were considered to be too strong and that because they were, it was considered that this intervention would have limited their testosterone level. So the, the thing is, again, monitoring the bodies. We don't monitor the bodies of men as much as we monitor the bodies of women. And this is a fact. Matteo Winkler, as a specialist in public international law and conflict of laws, how do you think the appeal in the European Court of Human Rights will go? I don't want to anticipate, of course, the decision of the court, but the precedents seem to tell us that the court is, is reluctant to take that position. So to replace sport authorities and tell the world athletics what they should do, how they should regulate these cases. It's true that no matter how the court will decide, this will generate a, an intense debate uh, among sociologists, anthropologists, and, and, and lawyers, of course, regarding gender binaries, sport, arbitration, and, and so on. The problem, the background problem of this case is that when you talk about sport, there is not a real court monitoring over the respect of human rights. So the, the Court of Arbitration for Sport has been criticized for not being uh, a, an efficient and a useful and effective tribunal that ensures the respect of human rights. Perhaps the European court will be one of the last instances where we will see this uh, relationship between sport and human rights addressed from a non-comprehensive way, in a non-comprehensive way. And this despite a broad coalition of criticism. There's the World Medical Association and Bioethics, medical and human rights experts. Uh, they've also condemned the World Athletics application of arbitrary testing based on stereotypical gender norms and, and flawed science, as you call it. So with such a wide range of groups attacking these decisions, how do you see this evolving? Yeah, I mean, there, is, there has been a very clear stance from medical authorities that they will not prescribe therapies, uh, hormone suppressing therapies to athletes under the IAAF, now World Athletics Regulations, because they do not intend to give treatment to something which is not an illness. Because, you know, having a natural high level of testosterone is not an illness, is not a pathology. So they refuse uh, they will be ethically bound to refuse giving uh, a treatment. So I think this is a, a very important point from the standpoint of health of people. Uh, should we oblige people to change their bodies for the sake of sport, for the sake of gender binaries? I think these are uh, the questions we need to ask. And, and I think that the medical... Uh, this course, the medical part of the conversation on Semenya is very important, but is limited. Uh, we need to connect it with other aspects, with other narratives, as we examine in, in our article, that uh, give you an, an all comprehensive uh, 
a view of the case and not just from the health sense point. I think the health is one of the issues of this case, also very important. So, Matteo, let's conclude by reflecting on a more general angle. Uh, both Human Rights Watch and the UN note that World Athletics, uh, the WA, is a private entity. As such, the organization should surely comply with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, the so-called RUGGY principles. What are your thoughts about the WA adopting the approach that other businesses have? That's to say, committing itself to the guiding principles on business and human rights and to respecting all internationally recognized human rights. Regarding business, uh, yes, a conversation is ongoing. I think that there is always a conversation in the European Union at the legislative level for making um, human rights compliance part of the normal compliance of corporations. I know that many corporations I work with uh, they already uh, embody human rights principles when they are doing M&A, for example, or when they are doing due diligence on a new business, on a new line of business, when they are working in certain countries. They do actually do some human rights due diligence. This said, it's of course one thing is to act upon moral principles and another thing is to act upon law. We lawyers tend to reason by saying that if something is not binding, it doesn't exist. And I think when we talk about the relationship between business and human rights, we need to change this attitude and broaden our view to say uh, that what in practice is done uh, is uh, very important. And so, so that this practice of considering uh, human rights part of the compliance discourse is certainly one of the aspects relating to this point. And therefore, to say uh, not just everything that is the law is effective and binding and useful, but also what actors, what public actors do is also very important. Great, uh, Matteo Winkler, thank you very much. Uh, any final comments uh, you'd like to make in closing our exchange? Yes, if I can hyper simplify, never take a no as an answer. I think this, was, this is what Semenya has done in her life. And uh, she won because she deserved it, not because uh, she has been unfair. So I think we should all uh, try to um, understand ourselves and be ourselves and make the world recognize us as what we do uh, and as what we are uh, through our battles, through the battles that we do for our own uh, individual rights. Well, thank you so much, Matteo Winkler. It's a pleasure to have you on HEC Breakthroughs uh, all the way from Milan, Italy. Uh, but I'm hoping to see you on the HEC campus as soon as the COVID-19 crisis uh, allows us to return. Likewise. HEC Breakthroughs, a knowledge at HEC podcast. Well, that concludes our exchange with Associate Professor Matteo Winkler on Castor Semenia and transgender questions. Oh, and just to add that sexual gender controversies aren't confined to attacks on black women athletes from the Global South. A recent nude self-portrait by the fashion photographer Michael Bailey Gates has created quite a storm on social networks. That's because he promoted his androgynous looks whilst holding a luxury handbag. Look it up to see what's creating the brouhaha. Well, that's it for this month's HEC Breakthroughs. We'll be coming back in August for a podcast spotlighting a recent study on truth distortion in the COVID-19 era. The study is co-signed by HEC's Anne-Sophie Chaxel. Now, that's a hot topic that won't go away in a hurry. Fake, disgusting news. The fake media. And the fake news refuse to call it, right? Everybody, we, we do it. We distort our truth judgment. It has nothing to do with only uh, Donald Trump. We, we tend to do that always. Like the, the phenomenon in itself is, uh, is very robust. But I think we are less aware of it. It's less in our face. We as individuals have this bias that we tend to believe more an uncertain statement based on our prior preferences. This happens all the time. And we, we're just not aware of it. It's, we have a complete blind spot for our biases in general, but for this one in particular.
marketing professor Anne-Sophie Chaxel. In next month's breakthroughs, she'll be shedding light on her use of marketing techniques to decipher people's responses to controversial statements linked to the virus. So tune in to this Knowledge at HEC podcast, available on all the major platforms. So long.